Here, my daughter here, and then all left for her food. She is still in agony for it. I guess near the grass the run or in the the hurt can create on a score. Ucha has over a nil of rear. I guess the nil of any faster. I guess the create a create no for each increase third year. Direct, we beseech the Lord directions by Thy holy inspirations and carry them on by Thy gracious assistance, that every word and work of ours may always begin from Thee and by Thee be happily ended. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Now, members will take leaders' questions. Understanding Order 36. Welcome, Deputy Mary Lou Macdonald. Gurmila Mahagat, Count Corla. Count Corla, I would first like to address uh, information which I placed on the Dáil record last week relating to an incident where a Sinn Féin representative sent inappropriate text messages to a young person. It was then my understanding that the young person was 17 years of age because of the information provided on his application form when he applied to join Ogre Hinn Féin. That information was wrong. The young person themselves have made clear that he was in fact 16 at the time. So I want Count Corley to correct the Dáil record to reflect that he was in fact 16 years of age when these texts were sent. I have now written to the young person and his mother offering a full, unequivocal and sincere apology. What happened to this young person was wrong. Niall O'Donnell's behaviour was unacceptable, utterly inappropriate and no young person should have experienced that. And I am also very sorry for the hurt that my words caused in the statement that I issued following his resignation. That was never ever my intention. And I apologise to that young person for issuing that statement. Gormagat, Count Corla. Tishuk, our student nurses and midwives are incredible. They do invaluable nursing work while on placement on wards and in fact they keep our hospitals going. They do a minimum of 20 hours, 28 hours a week and they work far beyond their training duties. The McHugh Review of 2022 addressed pay for intern nurses. However, the new subsistence allowance for first to third year student nurses doesn't go far enough and leaves so many in very difficult circumstances. The review failed to address supports for other students working in clinical placement in our health service. Our student, one student nurse wrote to, I think, every TD at the weekend to say, in my first five weeks of studying to be a general nurse, I was told how to save a life, how to bathe a paralysed patient, how to care for the elderly and infants, but then went on to say, it's clear to me that the role of a student nurse is not valued. The work that student nurses and midwives do is invaluable, but they are also experiencing a cost of living crisis. They struggle to find accommodation, they're forced to pay rip off rent when they do so, they're forced to commute long distances when they can't. The mother of one student nurse wrote to my colleague Maureen Farrell to share the distressing situation that her daughter is in. She's a second year uh, student nurse. She commutes a long distance to and from her placement uh, because she can't afford accommodation. She's fr slept on friends' sofas while working shifts in a maternity ward from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. And now things are at breaking point for her. Her mother wrote this. She said, we now have to borrow money from family to put her up in a hotel for the days of her placement. The HSE told her not to even ask for reimbursement. We can't afford 300 euros a week. We're on low incomes. We're sick at the thought of what will happen. The stress is, it is causing is sickening. She breaks her back studying and working. She has the loveliest nature and will be a lovely nurse, one of the nurses that our country is crying out for surely this can't be right. And Tishuk, this uh, student nurse is not alone. So many others are pushed into very difficult situations while pursuing their qualification and working hard for us in our hospitals. And by the way, this isn't about a return to the apprenticeship model. This is about a fair deal for students working in our health ser service. Toshe, Haraum, Gumeak Realtis, Aginga Herhuk. Corum Nefena de Ibriha Corum Slancha in Elunch. Tishuk, do you agree with me that healthcare workers in training should have a fair deal for the work they do when on placement? And will you commit 
to delivering that ferry deal for first to third year student nurses and midwives. Thank you, Deputy MacDonald. Seizure, please. Thanks very much, Ken Corn. I want to thank uh, Deputy MacDonald uh, for raising this uh, important issue, and I join with her in acknowledging, uh, as she rightly says, the very important role that student nurses play uh, in our in our health system, in our in our hospitals, in our community during their training. And she's quite right to make that point. And of course, student nurses in their fourth year and their final year are paid, but you're talking specifically about their first to third year uh, as well. Now, my colleague, the Minister for Health, I know, uh, did have an expert review group that did look at that profession in general and how we could support people at all stages of their progression from the student nurse uh, right through. And my understanding is that that report did make a number of recommendations in relation to increased levels of support and subsistence, recognising things around travel uh, and accommodation. I truthfully don't have it here in front of me, but from my memory, I think this was something that would have been developed in consultation with the likes uh, of the INMO as well. But we're certainly happy um, if there is a wish to have further engagement on that uh, with the representatives to, to, to do just that, because you are right, we, we all want, I think we can agree on this, we all want a fair deal uh, for those that are that are providing care, albeit as students, uh, in, in, our, in our hospitals, because that care is invaluable. And we do want that to be fair, and certainly we had taken some measures uh, to endeavour to address that. But clearly you're outlining a case there uh, that the Minister for Health would be happy to take a look at and maybe raise uh, with nurse representative bodies like the INMO because we were of the view that we had made some progress through that uh, expert review group report. Uh, but let's take that away. Very happy, uh, very happy to do that. I would, while we're on the issue, make the broader point. And, and, and you said not to mention the apprenticeship model because I think that's separate to your, to your question. I do get that. But I would make the point we have tried to broaden the number of places in the country where you can access uh, nurse education and try to partner more uh, with local hospitals in that area. So indeed, Deputy Farrell, who's brought this issue to your attention, would know very much uh, in the Galway area, working now with the tertiary degree programme, we have seen more opportunities for more people to access nursing courses closer to their home and also hopefully their placement uh, in what we could call as the local or regional hospital as well. I hope that'll have a, a positive impact. But look, we want more student nurses. We're trying to grow the number of people who are studying nursing. We're growing the number of college places in our healthcare professions. And of course, if there's cases coming through of people who are finding uh, that cost of living challenge uh, acute, uh, the Minister for Health will be happy to engage further on it. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Taoiseach. You remember um, during COVID, and there was a, a huge discussion around uh, student nurses uh, and midwives and the work that was being done, and the fact that at that point that wasn't being adequately recognised and, and, um, and compensated. Um, and I, I just think it's really problematic that we're back in a space where uh, young students uh, of nursing and midwifery feel again that they're not being recognised and they're not being valued. The last thing we want is these young uh, professionals feeling that they are not valued within the Irish health system and making a decision to make their contribution in Perth or Toronto or uh, wherever that might be. The, the case uh, brought to the attention of, of uh, Deputy Farrell is by no means an isolated incident. This is a, a widespread experience. Um, and in fact, many uh, of the students are now talking about organising for demonstrations and to bring political pressure to bear, and rightly so. We have a proposal, Taoiseach, for a €3,000 uh, bursary. Uh, we'd like to uh, discuss that with you. We hope that you would uh, adopt, uh, not least because we'll be heading into elections very soon, you inform us, uh, and young people and uh, students working within the healthcare system are going to watch very carefully to see what we have to say and to see whether or not, Taoiseach, uh, we are prepared to put our money where our mouths are. Thank uh, on you, this side of, side of the House, we certainly are. I'll send on details of the individual case to the Minister, but I hope you take the point, and it's made in good faith, that it is in all of our collective interest to get this right for these uh, students, make sure that they, can, that they can live, that they can survive, and in fact that they can thrive. Thank you, Deputy Thank you. McDonald. Thank you. I'm glad you've picked up my election hints. Anyway, I thought they were rather subtle. I thought, <laughs> goes, there goes the surprise. <laughs> but no, look, <laughs> thank you. To, no, look, it's a serious issue the deputy's raising, and I, and I do appreciate that. Look, I, I'd make the point um, fairly 
that we have significantly increased the level of supports uh, to our student nurses. Um, we did that, as you rightly say, uh, arising from the debate around COVID and post-COVID in relation to the very important role being played by student nurses. Again, I don't have the specific figures in front of me, but I, I think the level of support we're providing through that subsistence, travel and other supports uh, has risen by, by, by several million over the last couple of years. But we are happy to, to engage further on this. I would also make the point to those student nurses, of course, we've also done other things that will help them along with other students, whether that's reducing student fees, uh, improving student grants, making nursing available uh, in more parts of the country and in ways that works for more people, uh, and also extending the renter's tax credit uh, to cover students as well. But very happy to, to take a look at it. The only thing I would say, as we come into that election season, we obviously do need to acknowledge there's lots of students carrying out important placements as well. Um, and obviously when you look at one group and nurses and student nurses are an extremely important group, having some degree of a consistent approach, I think, uh, to all of the people that are playing an important role in our health service as students is something that certainly I know other, other professions uh, would mention to us regularly as well, but I'm happy to follow up. Thank you. Deputy Holly Kearns, please. <coughs> Taoiseach, you've confirmed that we'll have an election in a matter of weeks and with that, this government's disastrous handling of the housing crisis will be on the ballot. A vote for this government will be a vote for record house prices, record rents, record homelessness and over half a million adults living in their childhood bedrooms. Every week, this crisis deepens and deteriorates. House prices are now rising by double digits, 10% per year. Nationally, first-time buyers are facing medium house prices of €345,000 and a staggering €462,000 in Dublin. Who can afford these kinds of prices and relentless increases? As soon as people think they've scraped and scrimped enough to buy, the prices change again, the goalposts shift. This is why people are losing hope. Because no matter how hard they work, how hard they save, how hard they try to do everything right, it is never enough. Every month, house prices climb even higher. Since this government took office, median house prices have increased by 85,000 euro. Taoiseach, that's more than €20,000 added to the cost of a home every single year. Do you think people's salaries are increasing at that kind of a rate? Are teachers, nurses and guardie, for example, getting their pay bumped by 20 grand a year? Because that's what they need just to stand still. To make matters worse, and frankly just confusing, the government keeps telling them that their plan is working. It's only working if your plan is soaring house prices. And that is a plan that only works for developers and vulture funds. Last week, the Social Democrats launched our affordable housing plan. It's fully costed, credible and deliverable. Under our plan, three bed homes could be delivered in Dublin for less than 300,000 euro per year. In the rest of the country, prices would be below 260,000 euro. The people buying these homes would own their home and the land it is built on. Affordable rental is also a key component of the plan. Over the term of the next government, we would deliver 75,000 of these genuinely affordable homes. The Social Democrats want to go into government, not to make up the numbers, but to treat housing like the emergency that it is and to take radical action to address it. Taoiseach, you said at the weekend we need 60,000 homes a year. That has been obvious to everybody other than your government for a long time. But the key question is not the target, but how will we get there? And people, how will the people on average incomes be able to buy them? Taoiseach, my questions are, do you think house price increases of more than 20,000 per year are sustainable or affordable in any way? And do you accept the government policy is driving record house prices. Thank you. Taoiseach, please. Thanks very much, Deputy Kearns. Well, firstly, I, I agree with you on one, I definitely agree with you on one point, which is that politics and the next election certainly can't be about who comes up with the biggest figure in terms of the number of homes they're going to deliver, because the public will rightly see through that. What people will be much more interested in is the how 
Uh, I think that is absolutely right because you said, you said there are people, you know, everybody knows we need 60,000 60, homes. That's kind of neither here nor there. What people need to know is how are we actually going to get there. And the idea we could have gotten from a low base of under 7,000 homes being built in the year 2011 uh, to 60,000 homes any earlier than now, I don't think is borne out by any evidence. And I'd be very happy to meet the housing expert or the construction expert who would counter that point. We're at a situation now where we're going to see close to 40,000 homes uh, delivered this year. And these people buying new homes aren't imaginary. I mean, you, 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 tell, you tell a story of the housing challenge, which is real, absolutely real. But also, what is also real is the fact that there are 500 first-time buyers buying their own home every single week. That's real. And surely you must meet these people as you go around the country. You must meet these people in your constituency. I certainly meet them in mine. Um, so I, I, don't know if, I don't know if the rest of you don't meet them. I meet people every single week buying their home, buying homes that didn't exist uh, only a few years ago. And that's because there's 128,000 additional homes that have been either added to or brought back into our national housing stock uh, in the lifetime of this government, 116,000 of them uh, being new-built homes as well. And it's not just my word or my anecdote that actually shows that there is progress in terms of people being able to access their own home. Because if you look at drawdowns, look at mortgage drawdowns, so not commencements, not completions, the number of people drawing down a mortgage, it's true to say that the first time buyer drawdown reached a peak of almost 26,000 uh, last year, which was the highest annual level since 2007. So when you talk about a loss of hope, I fully accept there's huge challenges when it comes to housing, not just in Ireland, but right across Europe. But I also know that there's very significant hope when we saw more first-time buyers last year than any year since 2007 draw down their first mortgage. They're real people and they're real facts uh, and that does matter as well. When it comes to the issue of affordability, I am absolutely aware and you'd want to live under a rock to not be aware of the huge challenges that people face in terms of trying to get their deposit together to buy a home. I met people as recently as Sunday on doorsteps who raised that issue with me. But I'm also aware when I engage with those people, that there are a number of supports that government has put in place that is making a very significant difference to them. Whether that's the Help to Buy scheme, where about 50,000 people have now benefited from that scheme. Whether it's the First Home scheme, where we're actually helping to bridge the gap between what you can get as a mortgage, what you can afford, and the price of a house. So when we look at headline house figures, that doesn't tell the full story because we are intervening in terms of a level of subsidy that is without precedent in this country. And I will read your plan, I haven't yet read your plan, but I hope that you'd certainly commit, if in government, to keeping some of those schemes because if not there's tens of thousands of people who are hoping to avail of them in the months and years ahead who I think would be terribly disappointed. Deputy Cairns. Um, the figure you give of 40,000 homes, so that's disputed by the RSI and the Central Bank. We know that commencements are one thing and completions are another thing altogether. And for the first six months of this year, completions are down nearly 10%. So that's the reality. Um, and you mentioned the help to buy scheme. And, you know, in relation to that, the URSI has stated that if the help to buy scheme was scrapped, that house prices will fall. So while we can all understand that it can feel really supportive in that moment when house prices are so high to get that grant, it's, I think, a sad indictment of this government that that's really the only defence you have. And the URSI have said that removing it would actually bring down house prices. But, Tisha, people watching at home can see that you're just not answering my straightforward questions. Instead, we just get deflection and spin. And the facts are actually clear. Median house prices are soaring by more than €20,000 a year. And listening to you, you'd swear that's evidence of a plan that's working. Is that what you're saying to people when you meet them on the doors? Because the people that I meet are completely fed up and exhausted, and they're giving up on ever being able to buy a home in this country. Taoiseach, this is the record of your government. And like I said, that record is going to be on the ballot at the very least, I think, for people to think that you would just accept that your policy is driving house prices might give some hope that you'd be able to address it. Do you at least accept that the government's approach has failed? That not introducing a vacancy tax with teeth, you, not banning the bulk buying of homes, not addressing these issues has not worked? Please, please. But there's no balance to your argument. I mean, this is the point. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm able to stand here and I'm able to talk to the electorate on their doorstep and I'm able to point to progress and also point to more to do. You just want to dismiss any of the progress as though, as though those extra 128,000 homes don't exist. And I'm interested in what you're saying now because you set out your stall if you're to be in the next government. Well, if I'm to be in the next government, the help to buy scheme is staying. It's absolutely staying. 
And if you want to get rid of it, and if you want to tell the people who are processing their applications, probably right now in banks across the country, that you're in favour of getting rid of it, fair play, that's your position. It's not mine, and I won't go into government with anybody who doesn't keep it. Um, it needs to be kept, as does the First Home Scheme. Both of them need to be kept, because they're practical levels of subsidy, using, giving people back a little bit of their own money to actually help them save a deposit is, is exactly what my party and this government uh, intends to continue to do. When it comes to bulk buying, you talk about spin and deflection. You don't say in your piece, Deputy Kearns, that we've taken more action in relation to bulk buying and stamp duty as recently as a couple of weeks ago in the budget. We've again increased the stamp duty rate. And also, when you talk about house prices never being higher, let's not ignore the analysis from the central bank as recently as last month. It shows that house prices relative to household disposable income is now 4.1 compared to 5.5 .5 in 2007. I am aware that the biggest issue facing people in this country, the biggest issue facing our economy and our society is housing. Absolutely, that is true. But I'd much rather have a debate about how we can improve the initiatives that we have in place to make them work for more people, how we can get that housing supply from the 40,000 to the 60,000, than this idea of actually telling people that there hasn't been any progress made in the last number of years. It's not borne out by fact. 500 people every single week, including in your own constituency, are buying their first home, and that mortgage drawdowns for first-time buyers at their highest <coughs> level ever since 2007. They're also facts. Have you Richard O'Donoghue, please? Taoiseach. Michael Collins was born close to Clonakilty. Not that one there. <laughs> Sorry? Not that one. No. So where Fine Gael was born was close to Clonakilty, to the son of a farmer. Even though your government, since you've come into government for decades, you've done nothing but closing down farms around this country. You then go to Eamon de Valera, who was born in New York and was raised in Boree County, Limerick. Again, far from a fall. And again, we look across this government over decades, slowly taking out the people around the country. At one time, Fine Gael were seen as the Farmers' Party, which they are no more, and Fianna Fáil were known as the Workers' Party, which they are no more. You talked to the previous speakers about building houses and building things in Ireland. The discrimination of this government against people around Ireland is evident when you look at infrastructure. You look at where the money has been spent in infrastructure around this country and you see that it has been based, a lot of the money that has been spent has been actually within Dublin itself. So this government as a government is supposed to reflect the country for investment in infrastructure. You watch television during the week and you'll see the biggest polluter in this country, which you've been roaring about for years as being farmers, is actually the government because of lack of infrastructure. Sewerage systems that your government have promised for 40 and 50 years has never been upgraded, which does not allow people to build in their own towns and villages. This is what I'm talking about. You then look at Ishke Ehren where they look for 6 billion euros at the moment. And they're saying 120 billion they need to fix it. And we see in Croom at the moment, where we had 5 and 6 billion euros spent on a water system, they're now trucking, bringing trucks of water in, six per day, at the moment costing 200,000 a month to bring water in, even though the pipe scheme is there. We're talking about waste of funds. We're talking about rebuilding Ireland. How can any business, any person in Ireland, have fairness if you don't give them proper funding for infrastructure in this country? That means that you're putting the infrastructure into highly populated areas and you're discriminating about the rest of the counties in Ireland that want to prosper. They want to be able to afford a home in an area where it is affordable for them. That's what we want. So shared infrastructure. But I'm also looking for accountability for where your funding is going. You're not getting value for money. And that comes back to government yourselves to make sure the likes of Ishgairn are accountable for the funds, that it's top heavy. The problem is they're top heavy. We're not getting value for money. That means we build no homes. No matter what you say we're producing in this country, it is not for the country. It is for certain areas in the country, which discriminates against every working person in Ireland to make sure that they get homes in their own areas. You should please. Well, thank, thanks very much um, for that, uh, Deputy. Um, so my party in this government uh, is proudly 
supporting uh, farmers uh, rural Ireland and the agriculture sector. Uh, we meet them on a very regular basis. I meet them on a very regular basis. I uh, meet them with the Minister for Agriculture regularly as well. And we took a number of decisions in the budget uh, to further support farming and farmers, including making sensible changes to the residential zone land tax, including extending the agricultural reliefs, which not every party in this doll I don't believe would do. As recently as today, at Cabinet, we established a commission on the whole issue of generational farming and how we can make sure, because one of the biggest issues I've heard as I visited marts and travel around the country and visited agricultural shows, one of the biggest issues that I've heard is the importance of a farmer wanting to know that there's a future for the son or the daughter who might want to take on the farm. And we do need to do more in relation to that, including looking at retirement schemes and the likes too. So we are in the business of listening. We're not in the business of talking down to agriculture. And I think what we need to be very clear of is, you know, agriculture isn't some nice to do thing and that people in the countryside do. It is the backbone. Uh, of the Irish economy. It's the part that doesn't leave uh, when times get tough. It's always here and it needs to be treated with respect. And I certainly don't, and I've never heard anybody in government suggest that the biggest polluter uh, is agriculture. And that's not borne out, as you correctly say, by any sort of fact or any sort of evidence. And, and again, no, the Greens have never said it either, not for me to speak for the Green Party, but they don't say that either because they follow the evidence. And in relation to this matter, uh, we saw figures out again today uh, that show more progress in relation to emission reduction and show farmers yet again stepping up and quite frankly farming and agriculture are making more progress than some other parts of our economy and that should be acknowledged too. The biggest issue farmers are bringing up with us is the whole issue of the nitrates derogation. Very, very important issue and we're going to have to be ready to pull together as a country to don that Team Ireland jersey, the green jersey, to make sure we can retain the nitrates derogation uh, next, year, next year as well. When it comes to Ishka Erin, I mean we provided additional funding uh, of over of a billion euro to Ishka Erin uh, as recently as the budget. Um, this, this will help capitalise Ishka Erin to meet many of the projects that they need. But if there's specific issues, and you've mentioned some there that I'm happy to follow up on, uh, where you believe there is challenges in terms of delivery, uh, very happy to engage with you uh, in relation to that. When it comes to infrastructure, uh, Deputy, we now have a real opportunity um, to invest significantly in water, uh, in energy and in housing. Uh, the 14 billion from Apple, I presume most parties will have a view as to what that should be spent on. I think it should be spent on the issue of infrastructure. <coughs> Pardon me? Well, whether we have it, we have it anyway. We can agree on that much. So now it's a matter of having a discussion how to spend it. I'm sure we'll have that conversation again. But in, in relation to that, that does provide that does provide opportunities now in terms of how you would use that windfall uh, tax revenue to try and invest further in infrastructure. And I don't accept, and we can perhaps have a longer debate, and I imagine we'll have it in the not too distant future, Deputy. I don't accept at all uh, that this government doesn't have a focus uh, on rural Ireland, doesn't have a focus on regional Ireland. And I could point to countless examples of where we have positively invested uh, in the cities, in the counties, well outside Dublin, including your own in Limerick. You don't know who? I get to and, and I, if you look across the counties, which I have, and the reason I got into politics, and I'm a building contractor all my life, I'm a block clear by trade, is I want to help build for the future. Use my experience. I don't build for local authorities. I've always built, for, had our own jobs to do what we had to do. What I'm trying to say to you is, 40 years and 50 years they've been promised infrastructure by even Lyle like Collins behind you there has promised it in a skeeton. He never delivered it. Even your council that would look for it delivered it, never delivered it. 40 years. And he's retired now, no infrastructure. We look at Oula, we look at Drum Colour. I can go around the counties and look of all the promises that they've made. These are towns and villages around Limerick. That, that have looked for infrastructure and never got it. We're talking 40 years of promises. Every time there's an election, there's a promise of delivering. They've never delivered. 15, 20 years in politics, they've never delivered for the people of Limerick. And that has to be reflected across the country because no delivery of infrastructure. If we have infrastructure, we can build. That's the foundation. We don't have it. It has never been invested in it. So that's what we're looking for around this country. Give everyone in every county a fair shake at it. But your cabinet has to reflect that. And if you have all cabinet from one base, you'll never rebuild Ireland. Thank the you, team Deputy. has to be right, and the team has to reflect this country. The team that you've had already does not. Thank you. Taoiseach, please. Well, of course, I have a cabinet minister from your constituency. Uh, in minister. Junior, and now we've seen us since you stepped down. Please, please, now, will you let the teacher stand? So when, I, when, I, when, I, when I stepped up, I think is what you meant. Uh, when I step, you step up, I step, when I stepped... Please. Okay, he, he, he doesn't need any assistance. When I, when, when I became leader, I appointed 
uh, a minister from your constituency to the cabinet and Minister Niall Collins also serves your constituency uh, as well and both of them advocate uh, for the area and I look I, I don't think it, I don't think statements of uh, of this kind of absolute nature that no infrastructure has been delivered stands up to any degree of scrutiny uh, any degree uh, well well here's here's other facts as well when I visit your county, which I visit regularly and intend to visit very regularly shortly, when I visit your county as well, there, there, are, there will be, I, I wish you well in it, there'll be, there'll be, there'll be many, there's many people who can recognise that there's progress that has been made in relation to infrastructure. In fact, there's probably not a part of Ireland that has greater levels of third level uh, infrastructure per head of population uh, than Limerick City and County, providing young people now with three universities, three in Limerick, providing an incredible, that's infrastructure, I'm sure you'd understand, didn't accept and agree with me on it. In really, they're in your county of Limerick. Well, I presume Limerick City is part of your county, I think it is, yeah. Um, so that's fine. In relation to Askeaton, uh, the wastewater treatment plant is being advanced through Ishgaran by funding provided by this government. Funding that you probably come into the Dáil and vote against when we tried to pass budgets. So look, you have a job to do. I wish you well in it. It's to stand up and say everything's terrible in rural Ireland. I don't believe it. I don't believe the people believe it. And I look forward to taking our case. To Thank you very much, Taoiseach. On behalf of the uh, independent group, Deputy Michael Fitzmaurice, please. Um, Tisha, five weeks ago tomorrow, um, I had leaders' questions here. I brought up about a particular tough case that's going on for the last two to three years, um, young Sean. Young Sean is eating the couch at the moment, as well as opening the fridge and breaking all the delf, as well as going out and breaking the windows of the cars. Young Sean is still left the same way. And in fairness to your office, and the person, I'm not going to name him people, but the person in your office has rang me on several times. But I think there's a reality here, Tisha, and a sad reality we all must uh, face. We had the Minister for Disabilities on this. We had every Minister in Health involved in it. We are going to the top to you as our Tisha of this country. And unfortunately, all we have had Meetings, meetings, meetings. Waffle, waffle, waffle. And all we have got at the end of it is a father that's desperate, siblings that have been assaulted in the same situation. And then go to the other side of it, a neighbour of my own, a lady in her late 70s, that was to get a bed in the Beaumont where the family took the week off on five occasions, took an apartment in Dublin at a cost to themselves, took time off work to be with their mother, and every time it has been cancelled. More waffle, waffle, waffle. And isn't it a sad situation that the Tisha of our country, or our ministers, the money was given but if I'm a, the boss of a company, or if I'm the boss of something, I tell someone, you do that or you don't, one or the other. But there's two choices. You either do it, and if you don't produce the goods, you don't be there. The charity sector that the money was given to has failed this country. They, that's a sign of victory. When you look at people, they have turned that around the other way. And you know what they have told ye. Your own office. I've talked to them. I'm not blaming them. There's a person in there, in fairness, every day has nearly contacted me. But isn't there something awful wrong with this country in 2024 when a youngster is down in County Roscommon eating a couch? When a woman is lying at home bent over where her fluid has to be drained from her brain? And, her, and that cancelled five times. And we talk about all the money we have, and we talk about Ireland going forward. And what have we done? We have left these people desolate at the moment. Is that the type of governance that we should basically talk about or be proud of in 2024? Thank you. Please, please. Uh, no, no, it, no, it isn't. Um, it absolutely isn't. And there's nothing that I can say or I'm going to attempt to say to suggest uh, that it is. Um, because you raised the case of Sean Sullivan here five weeks ago and you told the Dáil in very um, vivid terms, very graphic terms, and I say that respectfully, of the huge challenges that Sean's father 
was was and clearly is um, experiencing and his concerns for the welfare of the rest of his family, for the welfare of Sean, and I'm sure for the welfare of himself. And as you rightly say, and I thank you for acknowledging, and my, my own office has been liaising um, intensively with Minister Rabbit, and I must say Minister Rabbit has been working very hard uh, on this case and continuing to liaise intensively with the HSE to try and reach a resolution to what is a very difficult, um, I don't say that to be dismissive, but a very difficult uh, situation. I understand the HSE met um, with Sean's father last week. Um, now, they have acknowledged the slow pace of securing a residential placement, which I think is a bit of an understatement. Um, funding does, as you say, remain in place, so this is not, as you've been clear on, this is not an issue of government funding. There's often in this house issues of government funding. This is not one of those issues. Um, and now we're being told that the Brothers of Charity are trying to stand up a residential service and that they're trying to recruit and source a suitable property uh, within the county. Now this week, and I, I take what you said about meetings at Waffle, and I'm, so I'm, I'm conscious of that as I say the next sentence, but my understanding is this week there's a further meeting scheduled between the HSC, the Brothers of Charity and the family. Minister Rabbit's going to go to that meeting uh, herself um, to express the government's utter dissatisfaction uh, with the, the bureaucracy uh, and along this situation is going on. Look, the broader point you make about the charity sector, there's a validity in it. And I don't say that to, and nor do you, I know. I don't say that to cast a kind of cloud over the sector or anything like that. Lots of good work happens in relation to that. But often the person with the disability isn't as empowered as they should be or their family in terms of what happens with the money that's allocated. And that's why I very much would like to see, and I know Minister Rabbit would too, a, a greater use of the personalised budget model where you're actually empowering the person or their family with the funding. So you're not leaving it up to uh, anybody, another organisation, to kind of get their act together or get a service uh, in place. I, I'm sorry my answer isn't more satisfactory. It's a really, really, really um, devastating situation for Sean and his family. All I can assure you is right up to my office. Uh, we're monitoring this extremely closely. I'm um, very sorry that Sean has been failed. And uh, Minister Rabbit, I know, will attend that meeting scheduled this week um, with the HSE and the Brother of Charity, and I'll speak uh, with her directly and keep in touch with you as well. On Beaumont as well, if you want to give me the details, I can talk to the Minister for Health. The person in your office, that they have been in constant, co constant contact. I am not having a go at anybody here. What I am having a go at is, since then, a meeting, a meeting, another meeting next Thursday. Talk, talk. But there's only one thing. The HSC have said, we have no resolution. Imagine that. That's the facts. The HSC have said, we have no resolution. So we're going to go into a meeting again Thursday, and we'll be within for another hour, and we'll be all around the table, and we'll hear the same thing, and we'll go on again. That's not the way you treat people with severe autism. That's not the way you treat families in Ireland. And on the other side of it, Tisha, I've talked about an elderly person. I'm bringing it from one side at you. Sean has just turned 80. We were promised this for two years, that if we weathered the storm, and by God his father did, he'd, be a, he'd have a place the day he was 80. And then on the other side, I have a neighbour that needs a drain from her brain of fluid. And five times, and that family, they're not millionaires, they're ordinary working people that are after renting an apartment in Dublin a few times to have accommodation while their mother would be in the hospital. And that has been basically cancelled every time. Why? Because they say the word that comes back is no beds. That's the word that's coming back from them. Whereas with Sean, they hadn't a house, then they had a house, they hadn't um, staff, then they were recruiting staff. You quoted it there yourself about staff. I'm hearing about staff the last 18, 18 months. In private business, if I go in as a subby to someone and I go in with tractors and dump trailers, I cannot say, oh, geez, sorry, lads, I've no staff. You'll be kicked out the door. That's the way it works. That's the ruthlessness of the private sector and how it works, and that's why it delivers. But in the public sector at the moment, there is no accountability, Thank you, whether Deputy. it's the HSE or whether it's the charity sector, whether we like that or whether we don't. And they're not listening to politicians, which is a damnable sad thing to see. Yeah, look, I think, 
I mean, you, you said to me that the HSE have said there's no resolution, and I, I, don't doubt, I don't doubt at all what you've heard. I mean, what, what they're telling me is that they're trying to do two things. They're trying to secure a property in the county and that they, in parallel, are running, when I say they, I mean the Brothers of Charity, in parallel, they're running the recruitment uh, to staff up that service. Um, that's what they're telling me is happening. Look, I think the most frustrating thing in terms of when I say Sean is being failed is Sean didn't arrive 18. Um, and there's been a period of time here that clearly wasn't effectively used. It's not an issue. I've had them in my own constituency in the past where there has been funding issues in relation to this. In this case, the funding has been provided. Clearly, the preparatory work was not done and Sean has been failed. The question I, I ask rhetorically, which I will endeavour to find the answer to now, is with the funding in place, can anything be done in the interim, even in terms of inreach for Sean and his family? Um, because there is funding in place that isn't being used currently, so I will uh, inquire further in relation to that. Regarding the constituent um, waiting for the bed in Beaumont Hospital, um, it sounds like a very serious situation she's waiting for, so if you want to send me the details, the Minister for Health can pursue that with the hospital. Thank you, Tisha.